it's been a long time since the valuations were reasonable, but the catalysts were in place. Yes. Uh, I think the fact that you look at this circumstance and you're still cautious means you're likely to make money. Uh, there are a lot of people who will draw solace from the fact that on news stocks are going up as opposed to sideways these days and become incautious. Uh, if you become incautious in this sector, you become poor and you do it very rapidly. Are you prepared for a potential black swan event that could rock the US economy? In this insightful discussion, veteran investor Rick Rule warns that an unforeseen liquidity crisis, reminiscent of the 2008 financial meltdown, could send equity markets plummeting by 50%. These black swan events, according to Rule, tend to occur every 10 to 15 years, shaking the market to its core. Whether we're ready or not, Rule highlights the importance of recognizing the signs and being prepared for such disruptive occurrences. While he admits that predicting the exact timing or certainty of these events is impossible, being aware and strategically planning for potential downturns is crucial for investors. Rule's extensive experience in the financial sector underscores the importance of strategic planning and vigilance in navigating these uncertain times. He emphasizes that, despite the inherent unpredictability, investors can protect themselves by understanding market dynamics and maintaining a cautious approach. As an example, the gold has moved because of central bank buying, and the central banks don't buy gold stocks. So the dichotomy between the move in gold and the lack of move in the gold stocks is fairly obvious. History teaches us that after uh, gold is established, the physical gold has established the uptrend, that eventually the gold stocks follow. So when I say we're in a sweet spot, uh, I, I really truly think we're in a sweet spot. The condition precedent for the gold stocks to move has already occurred and the gold stocks haven't moved yet. There is a skepticism in the market uh, because of the tepid response of the gold stocks, which keeps other people from competing with knowledgeable speculators such as myself. Uh, this feels to me just like as good as it can possibly get. I, I need to say that when I talk optimistically, uh, I, I stick to the proposition that I made the last time you, you uh, interviewed me, which is to say that uh, if you look at the length and breadth of the junior market, probably 80% of them are valueless. So you can't invest in the sector, but probably 5% of the companies generate so much performance that they add legitimacy and luster to uh, a sector where 80% of the participants are valueless. And it is that 5 to 20% that I'm talking about. Uh, when they say that there's no financing available for juniors, that's hokum. Uh, most of the juniors aren't financeable. Uh, I have participated, I think, in about 20 financings in the last 24 months. Uh, and uh, at least 15 of them were oversubscribed. Meaning, despite the fact that I'm a, high, a fairly high-profile investor, somebody who companies like to have on their roster, I got cut back uh, on my subscription. That doesn't seem to me to be a capital short market. But that, missed, that notwithstanding, uh, I think there are very, very good companies available for very fair prices. Uh, and that's a wonderful circumstance. Uh, and I use gold as an illustration, but clearly as an example, the copper thesis that we would have talked about on your show in 2022, had we talked, has played out. <laughs> um, you know, we talked about the fact that at twenty dollars a pound, it had to go up to a market clearing price. It had to go up to the price where producers earned their cost of capital. And guess what? It did. We talked about the fact that uh, the COVID depressed levels of oil and gas pricing had to increase when people began to travel again because the oil industry didn't earn its cost of capital and frankly couldn't pay their taxes at prior at prior prices. Well, it did. Uh, and the markets uh, have responded. So, I mean, I, I would say that we're, with regards to uh, mining equities uh, and mining private placement debt, that we're in one of those truly, truly, truly lovely circumstances. Uh, I, I'm not gonna say that we won't have a recession. Uh, and if we have a recession, that bull market's gonna be derailed for two or three years. I'm not smart enough to tell you that we are or we aren't. 
uh, I am smart enough or rather old enough to tell you that we will come out the backside of a recession. Uh, it's odd that at 71 years of age, I have more patience than most of your younger listeners, but experience has given me that. Uh, and we will come out of the backside of that recession. I'm also not saying that there isn't some sort of black swan event which could cause a liquidity squeeze, a 2008 style liquidity squeeze, and take all equity markets down 50%. That's something that could happen. It seems to happen every 10 or 15 years, whether we need it or not. What I'm saying is that if you look at the probabilities of all the circumstances in front of us, uh, the probability of supply shortages within five years in industrial materials like oil and copper, the probability of higher precious metals prices as a consequence of the deterioration in purchasing power offered up by fiat denominated uh, savings products, uh, and the fact that equity valuations are measured against commodity prices and historical norms attractive means that we are in a wonderful circumstance right now as investors. The circumstance which we enjoyed in the first six months of this year, anybody who didn't enjoy it wasn't a knowledgeable player, uh, will continue. Uh, the gratification which was inevitable is now imminent. <laughs> and that's just a wonderful circumstance. It's been a long time since the valuations were reasonable, but the catalysts were in place. Yes. Uh, I think the fact that you look at this circumstance and you're still cautious means you're likely to make money. Uh, there are a lot of people who will draw solace from the fact that on news stocks are going up as opposed to sideways these days and become incautious. Uh, if you become incautious in this sector, you become poor and you do it very rapidly. So I would suggest to people that they remember the admonishment at the beginning of this interview, which was uh, out of a population of 3,000 juniors worldwide, at least 80% are valueless. If you pay a penny a share for them, you're overpaying. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't go up in price. <laughs> it means that if you juxtapose the price to value, you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk. I would also, Andy, uh, further to that discussion of caution, uh, tell your listeners that one of the things that I've seen is that most people own way too many stocks. As you probably know, I've graded 80,000 investor portfolios over the last 10 years. Might include it. I, I've learned probably more than I've taught. And, and one of the things I've learned is that many speculators own way too many companies. Uh -uh. I have told people in the rural classroom that I believe that the number of companies that they should own in their portfolio corresponds exactly to the number of hours per month they, they plan to work. Uh, I think you need to allocate a minimum of one hour per company per month. Reading the filing statements, reading the annual report, reading the proxy, not listening to podcasts. That comes under the heading general education, not specific education. So if you can afford or stand or like to spend 10 hours a month, then you can own 10 juniors. If you can afford 20 hours per month, then you can afford 20 juniors. But I see portfolios where people who have lives, they have kids, they have jobs, they have stuff like that. And then they have 65 or 70 companies in their portfolio. It's impossible that they can follow that many companies. Tier one projects that are juniors, uh, which is to say projects that have the hallmarks of having a minimum of $10 billion in in situ recoverable reserves that would be in the bottom cost quartile worldwide and the top quartile in terms of return on capital employed, but at least 25%. Uh, if those projects aren't in glamour materials, they are stupidly cheap, really, truly stupidly cheap. Uh, there are projects that look like they could develop into generational assets that are trading at below 20% of indicated NAV. These are projects that, if the drilling continues as it has happened so far, will be sold to major mining companies. And they will be sold to major mining companies for 10-figure sums. Uh, the fact that 
the exploration project process, the delineation process, the PFS process is boring, uh, means that people have sold off these high quality assets uh, in favor of frankly shitty assets that have more near term momentum. There's nothing in the world that makes me happier than this, by the way, the fact that I can fill my boots for long periods of time with very little competition uh, around assets that seemingly to me have absolutely no downside except perhaps political risk and tenfold upside. So I, I really like that theme. The other thing I like is grassroots exploration with high quality teams, really high quality teams, intellectual capital. Uh, is on sale here. I just interviewed somebody who will remain nameless because I haven't bought my stock yet. Uh, with a market capitalization of about two million Canadian dollars, with a million two uh, in the till, tiny company, uh, and a veteran exploration team who have been active uh, in a country that I like for 40 years. Uh, they've been responsible for six or seven economic discoveries. Now, the fact that they've been successful before, before doesn't guarantee that they're going to be successful this time. But some of the past successes uh, have been sold for, you know, nine-figure sums. Uh, these people have spent their whole careers within 200 kilometers of where they're exploring today. The two properties in the company, 1.2 million in cash with a $2 million market capitalization valuation. This agglomeration of intellectual capital uh, were this a different type of market would have a $10 million pre money mark pre money uh, market capitalization. So I'm I, I'm pretty attracted to that. Um, the higher quality third tier royalty companies uh, have sold off in price uniformly uh, because they bore people. Uh, free cash flow is not a boring topic. And you have some of these companies which have one form or another of definable competitive advantage uh, over their peers. Uh, and there are several types of that that have reasonable um, <clears throat> asset spreads, uh, reasonable cash generation now with the probability or in some cases the certainty of increased cash flow from projects that are under construction. There's two things that happen here. Uh, either the share prices go up or the larger royalty companies with higher share prices and lower cost of capital acquire them. Thanks for tuning in to today's discussion with Rick Rule. Let's recap some key takeaways. Despite central banks buying more gold, gold stocks haven't moved yet, creating a sweet spot for knowledgeable investors. The skepticism in the market offers a golden opportunity for savvy speculators. Rule emphasizes focusing on quality over quantity, as only about 5% of junior mining companies are worth investing in, while 80% are valueless. A potential black swan event could cause a significant market downturn, but being prepared can help mitigate risks. He also advises maintaining concentrated portfolios, owning a manageable number of stocks that you can thoroughly research. Staying informed and cautious can make a significant difference in your investment strategy. If you enjoyed today's video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel for more insightful content. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to leave a comment below.